Spring practice is over, the transfer portal window is closed, and Notre Dame's roster for the 2023 football season is all but finalized. So, which position groups are the best and which ones are the worst? That's coming up next. You are Locked On Irish, your daily podcast on the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to Locked On Irish. It is Wednesday, May 17th, and thank you for making this your first listen of the day. The show is free and available on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. So whether you're watching or listening, please subscribe, like the video, rate and review. You know the deal. My name is Tyler Wojcik and I am the host. I'm a Notre Dame alum and I've been podcasting about the football team since 2020. And I'm also a producer for college football talent at the Fox Sports headquarters in L.A., Today's episode is brought to you by Bird Dogs. Go to birddogs.com slash locked on college. And when you enter promo code locked on college, they'll throw in a free custom Bird Dogs Yeti style tumbler with every order. And in today's episode, I'm going to rank the top position groups on the Notre Dame football team as I see it, starting with one and going through 10. The roster is pretty much set now that the transfer portal window is closed and Notre Dame was able to pick up their biggest need at safety in Antonio Carter II from Rhode Island. I did an entire episode on Carter's decision to come to Notre Dame on Monday. And I also talked about senior defensive lineman Alex Ehrenberger's decision to retire yesterday. So go check those out if you haven't already. But I don't expect there to be any major additions or departures in the near future. So I thought this would be a fun exercise to go through every position group and see who stands out above the rest. Now that it's May and we're smack dab in the middle of the offseason, I'm going to be honest, I'm probably going to be doing a lot of lists and a lot of rankings on this show during the summer months because that's what you do in the offseason and there isn't as much newsworthy stuff going on in the college football world nowadays. So if you've got some things you want to hear me power rank, hit up the show accounts across social media and maybe your idea will make it on the show. And now, for some context about how I rank these position groups before I get going here, the three things I prioritize the most are impact, starters, and depth. So as I was going through this, I was constantly thinking about how impactful is this position group going to be to the success of the team in 2023? How good are the starters and how much depth is there at the position? With that in mind, we begin with what I believe is the best position group on the roster for the Irish. And this one is pretty obvious. It's the offensive line. Joe Alt is the best player on the team and potentially a top 10 player in the entire country. And he plays the most important position on the line and really one of the most important positions on the entire team at left tackle. Blake Fisher occupies the right tackle spot, and he's also one of the best players on the team and could work his way up to being a future first-round NFL draft pick as well. Together, they make up what I think is the best tackle tandem in the entire country. And for as good as Joe Wall is, and he is great, I think his rise to the top, not only of the depth chart, but really the college football world, has sort of overshadowed the player that Blake Fisher is and could be. And I think he's poised to have an absolutely incredible year. He's slimmed down about 20 pounds. He looks more agile. And conditioning has been sort of a problem with him dating back to his high school days. And I don't think that's going to be as big of an issue this year because of how much he's worked in the weight room. So credit to him. I think those two are going to be absolutely outstanding this year. And they will probably be a big determining factor in how far Notre Dame goes this season. And then In the middle, you've got Zeke Carell, who doesn't have quite the star power that the tackles do, but he's a fifth-year senior with plenty of experience and was so good last year that he forced Jarrett Patterson to move over to guard to make room for Carell at center. Then who will start at guard remains a bit of a question right now, but redshirt freshman Billy Shrouth, he looks poised to take over the left guard spot, and he's one of the most promising young players on the entire team. You talk to the defensive linemen at Notre Dame, and they have nothing but great things to say about Billy Shrouth, specifically Howard Cross. In the lead-up to the bowl game last year, he said that Billy was going to be an absolutely incredible player, and I believe him. Andrew Kostovic looks like he's going to be the starting right guard, and even though he isn't as talented as the rest of this group, he's a fifth-year senior, and even though he might seem like the weak link, quote-unquote, of this unit, I believe he's a surefire starter for the majority of the Power 5 teams around the country. So, He's a great fifth starter to have on Notre Dame. He brings experience. Uh, He came in last year to replace Jarrett Patterson in that Ohio State game when Jarrett Patterson was out with an injury, and he held his own. It wasn't great. It wasn't terrible. But again, I think this is a really great unit as a whole, and I think that the guards will sort of figure themselves out. And even though Billy Strouth is probably going to deal with some growing pains, I think he's going to really excel as the year goes on. Depth-wise, Notre Dame has recruited the offensive line better than any position on the roster. And even though there's a lot of unproven guys uh, on the two deep, the main reason they're unproven is because the starters have been so good for so long that they prevented everyone else from seeing the field on Saturdays. So even though it's Joe Rudolph's first season as the offensive line coach with this group, the floor 
should be Joe Moore Awards semifinalist. And this group has enough guys to win it, in my opinion. And the team's success will hinge on this offensive line unit being dominant against the best teams on the schedule. So they're at number one. At number two, the cornerbacks. And the fact that cornerback is even number two is a huge testament to the work of cornerback coach Mike Mickens. He's done an incredible job on the recruiting trail and as a developer of talent. Ben Morrison, as a true freshman, was an absolute revelation last year. He finished the year with six interceptions, the most for any Irish player since Manti Teo in 2012. He could be a semifinalist for the Jim Thorpe Award down the road for the best defensive back in the entire country. Might be a little bit early to say that he'll do it this year, but potentially next year when he's a true junior. And then opposite him is Cam Hart, who's one of the best athletes on the entire roster. If he can just stay healthy this season, then he might have his best season to date. And if he does, Notre Dame is going to have one of the best cornerback tandems in the country. Cam Hart, at one point in time, um, he was on Bruce Feldman's freak list. Now he's dealt with a bunch of shoulder injuries throughout his career, so his health is going to be uh, a bit of a concern throughout the season. He missed off-spring practice as he recovers from shoulder surgery. But if he is on the field, he can be a really great player for Notre Dame. And then the depth at this position is better than it's been Honestly, in like decades, because Clarence Lewis and Thomas Harper, they're two veteran nickels with plenty of experience on the field. They will probably be fighting for that nickel spot. And if either one of these cornerbacks go down with an injury or just need a rep, need a break on the field, then they can easily step up. And I feel comfortable with them out there. Jane Mickey is a promising young player as well. He took some lumps last season as a true freshman, but Notre Dame's coaching staff felt comfortable having him out there. He actually played over Clarence Lewis in that USC game, which... To be honest with you, I didn't really understand at the time because he was getting cooked out there, but it shows the kind of trust the coaching staff has in him as a player. And then Christian Gray, true freshman early in early, he looks every bit the part of an elite college quarterback once he's had more time to develop as a college football player. He, he's uh, dealt with an injury during spring practice as well, but I think his future is bright. So unlike previous years, I think Notre Dame would be able to survive if one of their starters goes down. The days of Dante Vaughn coming in to replace Julian Love and then effectively getting torched and ruining Notre Dame's chances against Clemson in the college football playoff semifinal, I think those are long gone. I think the gap between the starters and the number two isn't as great as it used to be or isn't as steep as it used to be. It would probably make more sense there. But I feel really good about the starting unit. I think they could be great, and the depth there is great. So credit to Mike Mickens uh, for creating such a great cornerback room. Now, at number three, I've got the quarterbacks. Sam Hartman, the clear QB1 now uh, after spring practice. He might be the most proven player on the entire roster at the collegiate level. His 110 career touchdown passes and nearly 13,000 passing yards both rank in the top 20 in FBS history. He also rushed for nearly 1,000 yards over the course of his career at Wake Forest and added 17 touchdowns on the ground. I think he's the most talented quarterback Notre Dame has had since Jimmy Clausen, and Hartman has a much better team around him than Clausen ever did. So he has a real shot to completely light up the stat sheet this season, and there's a real chance that at the end of the year, I'm looking at this list again, like, how did I not have quarterback at number one? Notre Dame had Sam Hartman, who's one of the top five quarterbacks in the country. I'm an idiot. Hopefully, that's the case. But for now, I have them at number three, and a big reason for that is my concern about the depth. If Tyler Buckner had not transferred to Alabama, I think there's a real argument to be made that quarterback should have been number one. But unfortunately, Buckner did leave, and I have some real concerns about quarterback depth at the moment. Notre Dame is one play away from the quarterback situation potentially being really bad. We saw it happen last year, and right now, I'm not sure that Steve Angeli is a better quarterback today than Drew Pine was last year. Now, granted, <laughs> It's a pretty low bar, and I think that Angeli will hopefully be able to surpass it in time. But who knows if that will be the case this fall because for as much as Pine struggled last season, the coaches had ample opportunities to put Angeli in if they thought he was going to be better than him, and they never did. And I think that's a little bit telling. Now, Angeli could develop. He could become a better quarterback than Pine. That's all definitely on the table, and that could be the case in the fall. But right now, I'm just not sure. I could also see Kenny Minchie, the true freshman, asserting himself as QB number two by some point in the fall, but it's still so early in his career that I think it's going to take some time before he's comfortable out there. He did not look good at all in the spring game. Now, I'm not going to make too many harsh judgments on his first ever spring game. That's not fair to him, and it would just be unwise for anyone to do. And I heard that he had a really impressive scrimmage in the Jersey scrimmage the week prior, so that's encouraging to hear. He was a much higher rated recruit than Ancelli was coming out of high school, but Ancelli does have the benefit of one additional year in the system up to this point in time. So we're just going to have to see how that shakes out. I think that Kenny Mitchie is going to be a really good college quarterback in time. But for now, he's really only been a college student for a few months, and he's the clear third quarterback on the depth chart right now, right now. So if you guaranteed me that Hartman would stay healthy all year and then quarterback would be number one, 
honestly. Given how talented Hartman is and how impactful I think he will be for the rest of the team, I think he completely elevates the ceiling for the entire Notre Dame football team in 2023. But the fact of the matter is Notre Dame is one play away from that not being the case at all. We might be looking at a repeat of last year. But this is not a problem that is exclusive to Notre Dame, by the way. And I'm going to reiterate this point a lot because this is the reality of like 90% of football teams, not just at the college level, but looking at high school and pro as well. If your starting quarterback goes down, odds are your team is going to take a massive hit. And I think that's the case for Notre Dame this year. It was a risk worth taking to add Hartman this year because he's just simply a better quarterback than Tyler Buckner is right now, even if it potentially affects the quarterback position in 2024, which obviously ended up being the case because Buckner left. It was worth it. That's how good Sam Hartman is. That's how good he could make this team in 2023. And most teams honestly do not have a great backup quarterback because the great backups transfer so that they could become starters for other teams. So that's my first three. I've got offensive line at one, corner at two, and then quarterback at three. And stick around because coming up next, I'm going to go over which position groups I have at four, five, and six. And I can tell right now one of my picks is definitely going to stir up a strong reaction. You won't want to miss it. This episode of Locked On Irish is brought to you by Bird Dogs, some of the most comfortable shorts and pants on the market right now. When it comes to Bird Dogs, nobody does it better when it comes to fit, comfort, and versatility. I recently got a couple new pairs of Bird Dog shorts, and I can tell you right now, I look better and feel great wearing them. Their stretchy fabric makes them comfier than any of my other pairs of shorts, and their pants are so stylish that you'll have the freedom to wear them on the golf course, in a meeting, on a date, or hanging out with friends. I started wearing my Bird Dog shorts to the gym recently, and they're already my favorite pair to work out in. So go to birddogs.com slash college, and when you enter promo code LOCKEDONCOLLEGE, they'll throw in a free custom Bird Dogs Yeti-style tumbler with every order. Thanks again for making Lockdown Irish your first listen of the day. Today, I'm ranking the top position groups on the Notre Dame roster in 2023, and we resume at number four with the running back. So, I'm going to be honest. A few weeks back, I did an entire episode comparing Notre Dame's running back room to the best in college football, and my takeaway coming out of that was that the Irish had the third best running back group behind Michigan and Penn State. Now, obviously, the situation has changed. Logan Diggs announced on Tuesday that he is headed that he is headed to LSU. There's no surprise there. The only surprise, honestly, is that it took him so long to announce it. I saw him visit like South Carolina and some other schools. I'm like, dude, what are you doing? We all know you're going to LSU, and that's exactly what he did. He's going to be reuniting with Brian Kelly down there in his home state of Louisiana. So Notre Dame's running back room took a big hit with Logan Diggs leaving. I don't care how you spin it. Um, I've heard some people try to downplay it. And I'm not saying that Notre Dame is all of a sudden like the offense is completely changed without Logan Diggs, but it is a big, big loss for the running back room because Logan Diggs is just a very good player. Even though Audrey Kessman was always going to be the number one guy, you need two great backs to have a truly uh, elite group. And Logan Diggs is a great running back. He's obviously got some maturity issues to figure out, but I don't think you can doubt his play on the field, even if you have uh, an issue with some of his decision making. That being said, running back coach Dylan McCullough has built a really great group to work with, even without Diggs. Audra Kestime is coming off a breakout sophomore season in which he racked up 920 yards on the ground on 156 carries and 11 touchdowns. His 11 rushing touchdowns and 5.9 yards per carry led the team last year, and he looks poised to even have a better season this year. He looks leaner, quicker, and hopefully he's figured out how to stop putting the football on the ground, which was Kind of a big problem at certain points in the middle of last season. His fumble late in the fourth quarter against Stanford pretty much cost the Irish the game. Now it's just a question of who's going to be the number two back to go along with Estime. Jabron Payne looked the part in the blue and gold game, but he's dealt with health issues dating back to high school. The real X factor here, in my opinion, is Jadarian Price, who apparently outplayed Diggs and Estime during spring practice of last year as an early enrollee. And how Price recovers from the torn Achilles he suffered before the start of last season will go a long way in determining just how good this group can be this year. If he lives up to the hype he once had, and I'm telling you, there was a ton of hype. Coach Dylan McCullough, every time he's asked about him, he just raves about Price and what he could be. And unfortunately, we just haven't been able to see it a whole lot in action. But if he lives up to that hype and he becomes the clear number two to compliment SMA, in my opinion. But let's be honest, Achilles tears are no joke, and it's probably going to take some time into the season before he's back up to being 100%. I do not want Notre Dame to rush his recovery by any means unless they absolutely have to because I think he's got such a bright future ahead. There's no real reason to risk future injury by rushing him back if he's not ready. So hopefully, Jervon Payne is able to hold that spot over 
hold down that number two spot and then give Price some time to come back. And then once he does, I think he's going to come on strong and be a really great player for the Fighting Irish. We just have to be patient. Then you've got the true freshman, Jeremiah Love, who will join the team over the summer. He's the highest rated running back recruit to sign with Notre Dame since Greg Bryant. And he could make an early impact because he's such a great athlete. So even with the loss of Diggs, I feel really good about this group as a whole. And if one of those guys uh, behind SMA can step up this year and assert themselves as a clear as a clear number two and replicate the two-headed monster that we thought we'd see with SMA and Diggs, then the running backs could very well be one of the best position groups on the roster. We're just going to have to wait and see. All right, and number five. I've got the linebackers, and this one is is probably going to be pretty con- controversial because I know how people feel about the linebackers, and I, I get it. I understand they did not meet expectations last season, but I have faith in those guys to have a great bounce back season this year, and I believe one of the young guys like Jalen Sneed is really going to emerge this year and change the dynamic of this entire group. Losing Prince Colley to the transfer portal hurts, obviously, but I think the ascent of Jalen Steed and another sophomore, Nolan Ziegler, uh, played a part in why Colley eventually opted to leave for Vanderbilt and reunite with Clark Lee, the former Notre Dame defensive coordinator. I also think Jack Kaiser's move to Will Linebacker could really change how we look at this group because Kaiser's one of the most consistent players on the team last year when he was on the field. He was second on the team in tackles despite playing just over half of the snaps that Leofau played. Now, a big reason for that was because Kaiser played Rover, and a lot of times that Rover position was replaced by Nickel, which is played by Tariq Bracey last season, and there was a real case at multiple points in the season that Tariq Bracey might have been the best defender on the team. So Kaiser, as a result, did not get on the field as much, but now if he moves over to Will, I think that opens up a new lane for him to get on the field more. And then if he's rotating with Leofau, and then you add in a guy like Jalen Seats in the mix where guys are actually rotating, they're staying fresh, they're staying healthy, Healthy. I think the linebackers are going to have a really great year this season. I know how highly the coaching staff thinks of these guys, especially J.D. Bertrand. He's a uh, captain coming back this year, and I think he's going to have an exceptional year, especially when he's not relied upon to play 600-plus snaps or whatever, even with a broken hand like he had to do way back in 2021. So I feel good about this group. And looking beyond those guys, I feel great about the young guys and the depth behind them, uh, particularly the freshman linebackers and Drake Bowen, Preston Zinter, and Jay Osberry. Um, I don't expect to see any of those three on the field this year at linebacker. I do think they will be um, – important for special teams and maybe mix and match them so that they uh, can preserve their redshirt year so they only play in four games on special teams, potentially rotate. Um, and then next year, once all of those fifth years leave in Leah Fowl, Bertrand, and Kaiser, the linebacker spots are going to be wide open and these guys are going to have a great opportunity so they could start working towards that next year uh, by starting this season getting after it on scout team, getting after it if they're ever on the field at all, even if it's on special teams. So I feel really good good about this group. This is a bet. I'm investing my stock in the linebacker core. I don't know if this is going to come back to bite me, and we're going to be looking halfway down the season like Leo Fow is still just – just running straight into an offensive lineman again, and then I'm going to have to look back and this and be like, okay, yeah, maybe I was a little bit too high on him, but right now I've got the linebackers at number five. Okay, number six, wide receivers. And admittedly, this feels kind of low considering how high I've been on the receivers since the really the start of spring practice. And the thing holding me back here is that the top returning wide receiver only had 361 receiving yards last season in Jaden Thomas. And Granted, I think the play of the quarterback last season severely hurt the production of the wide receivers, and I'm going to just need to see some of these guys step up on the field Saturdays before I can realistically put them in the top five. I'm very high on the potential of this group as a whole. Jaden Thomas showed in the spring game that he could be a perfect match for Sam Hartman, but Notre Dame really needs guys like Tobias Merriweather and Deion Colsey to take that leap for this group to be truly great next year. And Chris Tyree brings a new element to this group that I'm excited to see. Then it's just a matter of which freshman wideouts can step up and make a difference this year. Jane Greathouse, the true freshman wide receiver out of Austin, Texas, looked like he could be one of the best receivers on the team during the spring game. When he led the team in receptions that game, he could be a very reliable possession receiver that could really help up. Uh, could really help make up for the loss of Michael Mayer on short passing downs. I'm not saying that Jaden Greathouse is going to be the next Michael Mayer, but what I'm saying is that he looked really good on short routes where Sam Hartman just pitch and catch, get a first down and move the chains. And I think Notre Dame is going to need several guys to pick up the slack to sort of make up for the production that Michael Mayer had last year and really throughout his entire career uh, to get that passing game going, especially on third downs because Michael Mayer was the guy in pretty much every third down. Rico Flores didn't play that great in the spring game, but he's another true freshman that by all accounts could make an early impact this fall as a true freshman. And overall, this group could definitely work themselves up these rankings by the end of the year. But until 
Will we see it on Saturdays? I've got them at number six. So the potential is great. The returning production is not. So we're just going to have to see. But I'm feeling really good about this group. And uh, I'm going to continue to be high on Chansey Secchi's group until uh, he gives me a reason to think otherwise. All right, stick around for segment three. We'll wrap up these rankings by going through groups seven through ten. Okay, coming in at number seven of Notre Dame's top position groups, I've got the tight ends, and I think this is a very deep group, but it lacks the star power at the top. And to be honest with you, it feels weird seeing the tight ends this low. When I was writing this out, I was like, wait, that can't be right. But this group has dealt with a lot of injuries over the past several years, and I think that's what's holding them back from being a little bit higher. Mitchell Evans is the clear starter right now, but he missed the first half of last season with an injury and had to sit out the spring game as well. In his lone game as the starter, though, last season, he finished with three receptions and 39 yards in the bowl game against South Carolina, including the game-winning touchdown, filling in for Michael Mayer as he opted out to prepare for the NFL draft. The staff is really high on Evans, who is actually a high school quarterback, and even though he's probably not going to put up the type of season that we become accustomed to for the starting ten- tight end at Notre Dame, he can be a really productive player for the Irish next season. And behind him, it's a bit of a crapshoot, to be honest with you, because there's a bunch of talented players, but a bunch of question marks as well. So Holden Stays looks like he's going to be tight end two at the start of the year. Stays appeared in 11 games last season, but only had one catch to show for it. Davis Sherwood, the former walk-on, he's more of like a fullback, tight end, H-back hybrid, but he'll line up as a tight end sometimes because he's such a violent player, an effective blocker. He's most effective on special teams, but... He did have a great catch in the spring game going across the middle on third down. I took a big shot too, so maybe he'll be a little bit more involved in the passing game this year, but I don't really expect that. He kind of reminds me of Tyler Luatua before the concussions because Luatua was a great blocker and so is Sherwood. Um, So we'll see what he's able to do this year. And then you've got senior Kevin Bauman and sophomore Eli Raritan who are both recovering from ACL tears that they suffered last year. Both Bauman and Raritan have dealt with their fair share of injuries throughout their respective careers so far, which is really unfortunate because they both came into Notre Dame with a ton of promise. I still have hope for Eli Raritan. It's a little bit tougher to say about Bauman, but he could be, you know, a good backup tight end potentially. But with Raritan, he's the most physically gifted of any of the tight ends on the roster, in my opinion. He's six foot seven, 250 pounds. Wide receiver coach Chancey Stuckey even referred to him as a Greek god last year because of his physique. But He's already had two ACL tears uh, before his sophomore season. So we will have to wait and see how much that impacts the game once he recovers. So overall, it's a very deep group, but it lacks the surefire impact player at the top, which is why I have them at number seven. At number eight, I've got the safeties. How How about that? Moving on up with the recent addition of Antonio Carter II, the grad transfer from Rhode Island. Without Carter... I mean, this group definitely would have been ninth or 10th, but I think Carter is going to be a starter by midseason, and he really changes the dynamic of this group as a whole. Xavier Watts looks like he's ready to have a breakout year, and if he's able to make that leap with Carter alongside him, then that duo will make for a really solid back end of the defense. It's not like national championship level or anything like that, but Notre Dame just needed it to be serviceable, and I think now with Carter, they're going to be a little bit more than that. My only concern with Carter is how he's going to handle the transition from playing in the FCS to the Power 5 level and how quickly he picks up on playing the safety position because Carter was more of a nickel slash cornerback at Rhode Island. But Notre Dame wanted him at safety because they needed a safety, to be honest with you, and they believe that he has the skill set to play that uh, position well. DJ Brown is a reliable reserve. He's in his sixth year, but he's not really a playmaker at the position. Um, but he's also a very smart player and could give you you know, 30 quality snaps a game as a reserve safety. His biggest issue has been tackling. He missed 12 tackles last season, which led the team. His counterpart, Ramon Henderson, also struggles mightily at tackling. Um, one of the first plays we got to see from DJ Brown at safety was way back in the season opener of 2021 going against Florida State. DJ Brown completely whiffed on a tackle that led to an 80-yard touchdown, and he was able to clean it up a little bit. I thought he was really solid as uh, Kyle Hamilton's replacement once, once he went down with an injury that year. But frankly, Notre Dame needs a little bit more from their safety back there. So I like DJ Brown as a reserve, not so much as a starter. Fortunately, Carter is an exceptional tackler, and I think he should be able to make up for some of those deficiencies of Brown and Henderson when he's on the field. But I'm still a little bit concerned about the depth because if an injury happens to any of those four, the the rotation will shrink quite a bit, and you're looking at playing true freshman Ben Minnick or Adon Schuler out of necessity, which I don't like. I don't like a situation ever where you've got to play true freshman because you have to, even if they're not ready. Hopefully that's not going to be the case here because I think both Minnick or Schuler could really benefit from a redshirt year, but we're just going to have to see. Schuler is recovering from a shoulder surgery as well. Minnick hurt his pinky, I believe, in spring practice. So those guys have dealt with some injuries so far, but hopefully they're not going to be on the field more than four games this season. So honestly, the safety position was in really, really bad shape a couple weeks ago. Adding Carter improves the group by a lot, but there's still reasonable concerns about the ceiling for this group, which is why they're so, on my, so low on 
my list. Then at nine, I've got the defensive line. And I went back and forth in this a lot. I don't love having them so low. I feel like I might be doing a disservice to them, but I just don't see a bona fide star on this unit. And I think that's really going to hurt them uh, against some of the top teams on Notre Dame's schedule this year. Notre Dame should feel good about the depth in the defensive line. Um, they have an effective two deep, so they'll be able to rotate eight guys comfortably. But you really need difference makers at this position to have a truly great unit. And we haven't seen that yet from any of these guys. Howard Cross is probably the most consistent returning player on this unit, and he's a nice anchor in the middle despite his lack of size. He's very technically sound, has great, has great hands, and can be disruptive. But he's not like a Jerry Tillery type of player. Then Jordan Botello has the best chance to have a breakout season out of any of these guys. He's at Viper, and if he does, we're going to be looking at this group entirely differently. But he's been too inconsistent throughout his career to put him higher. So even though I think he will end up having a great year, we just got to wait and see it. Um, and not just see it once, we got to see it sustained over the course of a full season. Notre Dame really needs a Ben Morrison-level surprise in the defensive line if they want to compete with the top teams. And I'm not even saying that. They necessarily need that type of breakout season from a true freshman. But really, for any player on this group to break out that we don't expect will at this point in time. Junior defensive tackle Jason Anya had a great swing practice, and he could uh, be a huge boost to the defensive line as the backup uh, defensive tackle. Riley Mills on the inside as well. He's probably got the best physical tools uh, to be a star, to be NFL ready. But we just have not seen it come together for him yet on the field in the fall. I'm hopeful that the position change back inside will be huge for him. And we have not seen a ton from Ohio State transfer Javante Jean-Baptiste during spring practice, but he's productive enough for the Buckeyes to make me think he will be an impact player in the fall. He's going to be rotating with Nana Osafo Mensa, the fifth-year senior at the strong side end. He's another guy who could make a difference this fall. He's been uh, more vocal as a leader so far this offseason, and I think the team looks up to them. So really, Notre Dame's got a bunch of good players, but they need a great player, and honestly more than just one to have a really great off, uh, defensive line unit. And Marcus Freeman has been on record saying that Notre Dame needs to be an offensive and defensive line-driven program. I've got the offensive line at number one, so they're doing their part. But the D-line is last among the position groups on offense and defense. So clearly, the defensive line is going to have to step up this season if Notre Dame wants to achieve their goals. And in order to do so, we're just going to need to see some of these guys who haven't been major players yet make a name for themselves this year and lift this entire group to another level. All right, last and I guess kind of least, the specialist. Uh, this might be unfair, I admit. But Notre Dame's likely starting kicker and punter have not even stepped on campus yet. Um, South Florida grad transfer kicker Spencer Schrader and transfer punter Ben Krim both arrive in June. Walk-on kicker Zach Yoakum was pretty shaky in the spring as a field goal kicker, although he was pretty effective on kickoff last year. And then sophomore punter Bryce McPherson has been up and down in the little amount of action we've seen from him. So even, this group, even though this group is last now, we really just kind of have to wait and see once these new guys get on campus before we can make a real evaluation. I guess the good news is they've still got long snapper Michael Milk Vincent for the fourth year in a row, and he's a leader not just for the group but the entire team. Um, and then kicker Spencer Schrader, the South Florida transfer, he went 9 of 13 last year, so that's pretty good. He's never missed an extra point uh, in his career in college, he, and his three of his four misses last season came from 40 yards or more, and he's got a career long of 49 yards. And then Ben Krim led the Ivy League last year with 41.6 per punt average, and he led the conference with 11 punts of at least 50 yards, which is one more than the legend John Sott had in 2022. John Sott, man, he was... He was nails, man. I did not expect that. So we will be missed this year, but hopefully Ben Krim will be able to step in and uh, fulfill his duties as the starting punter. Marty Biaggi, the new Notre Dame special teams coach, is a former kicker, so I have confidence he'll get these guys right, and hopefully they'll be able to come through in the big moments when we need them this year because those moments are inevitable. You're going to need to make some big kicks and uh, convert on some big punts in some tight spots if you want to be a championship level team, and uh, hopefully these guys will be able to do it. All right. There you have it, though. That's my list of the top position groups on the Notre Dame roster going into 2023. And I'll go through it one more time in the way out. At one, offensive line. At two, cornerbacks. Three, quarterbacks. Four, running backs. Five, linebackers. Six, wide receivers. Seven, tight ends. Eight, safeties. Nine, the defensive line. And 10, the specialists. And that is going to do it for me today. Thanks again for making this your first listen of the day. Please subscribe to the show if you're watching on YouTube or listening wherever you get your podcasts. You can also follow the show across social media on Twitter at Locked On Irish, on Instagram at Locked On Irish Pod, and my personal Twitter account is at Tyler Wojcik. That's at Tyler W O J C I A K. Same time, same place tomorrow, guys.